welcome back everyone, it's me, Matt, I hope you're having a great day. You know, there is some real fascinating pieces of military equipment out there, but when you start putting some of the most beautiful aircraft in the world in the same space, multiply that by 50 to 100 aircraft, it is almost bringing a tear to my eye. Folks, what you're looking at right now is what's known as an elephant walk. Now, the term elephant walk originated during World War II. Observers at the time commented that taxiing aircraft, and of course there were so many of them during the war, because of the fact that it was a world war, sometimes over a thousand at a time, resembled a herd of elephants on their way to a watering hole or that of a circus parade. Now, the term generally refers to sorties of exercises nowadays, where a fleet of aircraft taxi, depart or land to test or demonstrate readiness for combat. But, let's just be pretty honest here, it's also about flexing military might. When you're looking at this mount of F-22s on a runway, you know that they're clearly trying to make a pretty big statement to say, hey, by the way, we have some of the most sophisticated fighter jets in the world, lots of them ready to take off at a moment's notice, so... Just be careful. <laughs> and that's really the, the basis of Elfin Walks of today. It is to, to showcase military firepower that can be presented very quickly. But also the more serious side of it is not just flexing muscles. It's to actually showcase whether or not these aircraft can be de deployed from an aircraft strip very, very quickly. Um, you know, I've seen movies and... and I guess, hypothetical situations of airfields being bombed and, you know, jets are pulling out the hangars as, you know, JDAMs are landing all around them. And it's kind of scary to think that, you know, an entire fleet of aircraft like these beautiful F-22s could be knocked out on the ground. But of course, in a real world situation, aircraft like this would never be stacked up in that configuration ready to go. It's more along the basis of being able to stack, you know, five or six of these aircraft up at a time and getting them off the runway. Because putting that much firepower and that much money on the runway at any one time in a real life combat situation would be, well, I think an absolute disaster if you were actually being engaged by hostile bombers. Now, over time, it's been incorporated into a lexicon of the United States Air Force to be an identifying as a maximum sortie surge exercise, which basically means if they need to get everything out of that airfield as quickly as possible, they will do so. And it's not always down to the combat uh, requirements that are needed from these kinds of exercises. As you've seen in many different situations in America and other countries, Hurricanes and other natural disasters are also a huge, huge impact to airfields, especially uh, high crosswinds and damaging rains. Uh, some of these aircraft can be torn to pieces if they're left on the runway, or even some hangars sometimes. Uh, we're not talking about hangars that are like that of the Cold War era, where they're covered in, you know, six feet of concrete and rebar and grass and, you know, reinforced blast doors. We're talking about hangars that are basically just, you know, superstructures with some tin on them, uh, and they don't really do much to protect these aircraft. So they they also run elephant walks to have the ability to know that the aircraft can get out of that airstrip very, very quickly if there was a natural disaster coming, such as, you know, a hurricane. Because if a hurricane was coming, you want to get all those assets out of there to another aircraft facility very, very quickly so that the airfield can be, you know, rebuilt another day. These aircraft cost millions and millions of dollars. You really don't want to be causing problems. So they do practice these kinds of operations to make sure that they are protecting the assets they have in the airfield to ensure that they can be recovered somewhere else. But this exercise also reinforces the capability of units being able to work together. Of course, we are looking at fighter combat aircraft here along with some C-17s and logistics aircraft, which don't always work together coincidentally because of the fact that they just don't have the same operational tempo or the same operational requirement, but they still have to work together if it came to it. So it's nice to see that they can kind of push these kind of miniature sorties out there to practice working together. And also a huge, huge thing that they need to practice is the control tower. The control tower and the aircraft um, you know, support staff that are actually getting these aircraft off the ground need to learn, you know, what's going to happen if I do need to get as many aircraft off this runway as quickly as possible. And it's a really good exercise for them to kind of practice that teamwork. Um, it's often performed to prepare the squadrons for a wartime operation and the pilots themselves for launching fully armed aircraft in one mass event. Uh, they have had instances of basically putting as much ammunition and firepower on these things as they can, as quickly as they can, as kind of a joint exercise, and it starts from zero. So um, the reports that I've read is they have the entire squadrons set up at blank, and all of a sudden it's like, hey, it's go time, readiness time. I want everything loaded on these jets as quickly as possible, fully fueled, fully armed, same for the logistics aircraft, ready to launch in like, you know, however much time period that would be. And I'm sure it'd be pretty quick. I don't know if I could put a time onto that because I'm definitely 
being on an Air Force guy. Um, but the Air Force does a lot of these readiness exercises, um, you know, around the world, all the different air bases that they have, whether it be, you know, on U.S. soil or elsewhere. And, you know, the U.S. isn't the only country that does these kind of things. There are other countries that practice this kind of uh, maneuver, this kind of exercise. And in areas of personnel accountability, it's, it's pretty important, you know, they want to have the ability to know that how many pilots do I have that are op operationally ready uh, that can actually do this exercise. Some people may be sick, they may be, you know, having go other issues going on, they may have, you know, the capability of unable to fly, they're still a pilot, they're just kind of down and out for a little while. So it kind of reduces their combat capability, and these kinds of exercises may sort of test that, you know, ability to actually launch aircraft quickly. So it's why I always find it funny when people say, oh, look how much money's been wasted on doing this, just so we can flex our muscles. It's really not what it's about. Yes, of course, there is a certain attribute that comes from it, but its true capability is making sure that these aircraft can be put on high readiness extremely quickly, ready to do what they've been asked to do. Some of these squadrons or units are on actual dedicated missions in-house in country, which basically means, similar to the Air National Guard, that if something was to kick off, they must be ready to go at a moment's notice. There could be multiple simultaneous attacks, uh, whether it be by the air or by the ground, uh, on home soil of certain countries, and, you know, a couple of fighter jets on station isn't enough. They may have to actually deploy the entire fleet. Completely unrealistic and probably would never happen, but you never play with what ifs. You always have the capability ready if it needs to be. So yes, I understand that the amount of fuel being burnt through these aircraft, even though they're just taxiing around, and the man hours and the amount of support that's required to get them just to move around in their flight line is very, very high. You know, it's expensive, it ain't cheap. These F-22s, for instance, just the number of man hours to keep them operational is extortionate. But, you know, when you're talking about some of the most sophisticated pieces of, you know, military technology, you want to make sure that you have that capability ready to go. And testing those mechanics, testing the ground crews as well is very important, making sure they can upload these aircraft quickly and maintain them quickly. I can almost guarantee you that once all these F-22s got parked back in the hangars, the mechanics and the uh, air technics were probably just like, oh my goodness, we have so much work ahead of us. Um, you know, because I work in the aviation industry, I know what it's like when it comes to aircraft maintenance, the number of uh, things you've got to check and verify. But you know what? It's uh, it's part and parcel when you you know part of uh, an Air Force Institute. You've got to make sure that you're looking after your aircraft before they go anywhere. So for those of you, when it comes to looking at elephant walks, you know, reading into it way too much, just take it for what it is. You know, just look at the opportunity for you to see such amazing pieces of military equipment all in one place, and it's just awe-inspiring seeing aircraft of this kind and you know placed in such a beautiful setting. Uh, when they actually take off, it's even more incredible. You know, when the elephant walk turns into a full scramble and they're launching all the jets, that's uh, that's pretty cool. You know, most of these aircraft kind of taxi back off again. They're not going to put too much effort into launching them. But there has been elephant runs where they do push all the jets off the runway and get them up into the sky. And that's pretty cool. So whether you agree or disagree with elephant walks, I think we can all safely say that they are absolutely amazing to look at, uh, especially some of the more sophisticated fighter jets, but even some of the more cuter aircrafts like the Super Tucano, which we are looking at right now. Uh, I hope you all had a uh, good time watching this video and looked at some uh, interesting footage. If you've never seen an elephant walk before, well, at least you got to see it on, uh, on my channel. And if you can see one in person, well, good for you. I'm sure there's many people out there that have probably seen one in person. It'd be incredible to see an air show of doing a full elephant walk. That would be just an immense amount of cool uh, seeing so many fighter jets and aircraft, you know, punching down the runway at the same time. Uh, I actually did the uh, international air show back in England a long time ago at Duxford, I think it was, uh, when I was a boy in their B-52s landing. They had the F-22, they had F-16. I was just like, whoa, my mind was blown. Uh, but seeing them all on the runway at the same time, that'd be pretty cool. Anyway, I hope you learned a little bit about what the Elephant Walk is today. And again, just to appreciate it, not too much to learn really what it's about. It's pretty simple what it's about. But just to respect the fact that Elephant Walks are pretty cool exercises and routines to take part in. And uh, if you have actually been a pilot in one of them, I'd love to hear about your experiences below. If you think they're useless or you think it's just a waste of time, you're like, oh God, here we go, another Elephant Walk. Let me know. Um, thank you everyone for joining me today. I hope you enjoyed the videos. Please leave me a like and a comment. I hope to see you on the next video. If you want to be notified of any upcoming content, please click the little bell by the subscribe button.
You can also check out my Patreon account and my PayPal if you wish to support my channel. And a big thank you to everyone who has been supporting on, you know, Patreon and PayPal. It really does mean so much to me. So thank you so much. And I hope to see you all on the next video. Have a wonderful day, everyone. All the best. Bye-bye.